I, the, the thing that I wanted to say, I am going to talk a little bit about the work that we did on the Cambridge-Oxford arc um, in, the, in the course of, of my remarks, um, but the thing that I really wanted to say and that I wanted to stress, which is absolutely key to the, to the, to the subject matter of, of today's discussions, is that throughout the National Infrastructure Commission's work, since we were established in October 2015, the importance of cities, the challenges facing cities, mm -hmm and the role that infrastructure can play in tackling those challenges and enabling future growth and enabling the success of our cities has been really at the heart of our work. Um, we've been interested in the role of cities because they support a large and growing proportion of our population in the country. We've been interested in cities because they, uh, they are the en a large part of the engines of our economy, a much higher proportion of economic growth is seen in cities than you would expect simply looking at the population as a whole. Um, but also we're interested in cities because they provide in some ways a sustainable model of living. If you look at it on a per capita basis, carbon emissions um, are lower for those living, for those living in cities. There are cities depend much more on mass transit and less on the private car. There are ways, there are, there are elements of city living that are that are highly sustainable and that we should look to build upon. But some of those challenges that we face around population growth, around congestion, are exactly the kind of things that might put that sustainability at risk. For example, through the issues that we're seeing on air quality in London and other major cities at the moment. So, as I said, from the very beginning of our work cities have been at the heart of it and you see that from the fact that two of the first pieces of work we did in the National Infrastructure Commission were focused on cities looking at the role of both intercity travel in the context of Transport for the World City our report on H on Crossrail 2 and interest and intercity travel I always get those mixed up um, in terms of our work on Northern Powerhouse Rail and the potential benefits and impacts um, from improving connectivity between the major conurbations of the North. Um, and we were focused very much in those reports on what the role of those types of transport projects might be in each context in enabling and enabling particularly in the context of, uh, of HS of Crossrail 2 and promoting growth in the context of Northern, Northern Powerhouse Rail. And our work led us to support both of those potentially transformational projects. Um, but also to highlight strongly in both cases um, the need for an infrastructure scheme to form part of a, of a broader strategy for the transformation of the city or the city or the broader region. So in terms of Crossrail 2, that was focused particularly on housing. There's an aspiration for Crossrail 2 to unlock um, 200,000 new homes, um, but we didn't see that there was a clear plan in the same way that there was a clear plan for the delivery of the transport scheme for how that was going to happen. And without that, that kind of integrated planning, the opportunities that these schemes present is going to be missed. Similarly, on Northern Powerhouse Rail, it was instructed that the development of this scheme, and in many ways much of the development of the Northern Powerhouse programme, had been led by Transport for the North, which is basically a transport body. As far as we could see, there were, there were clearly transport challenges for the north of England, but transport is a necessary and not a sufficient condition for growth. And we, we argued strongly that it needed to be built in to a broader economic development strategy with a focus particularly on skills, if you were going to see the benefits. And actually there was a virtuous circle here in the sense that as the skills base grew and the, and the proportion of highly skilled jobs within the economy of those cities grew, the the need for intercity transport and the and the need for in, interactive working between cities would also grow and the business case for the transport projects would grow so the more that you could build these things together the more these look this looked like a strategy that would actually would actually take shape and move forward but as heather said perhaps our most substantial piece of work that we've done so far has focused not so much on the on the big cities on the london's the manchester's the birmingham's but on the highly productive smaller cities within the arc linking Cambridge, Milton Keynes and Oxford. Um, and these, were, these are three of the, the fast growth cities that were identified by the centre of cities. And, city, and as a result, cities that have very particular challenges, but also lessons that can be learned from looking at them more widely in the country. So our analysis in that report highlighted 
the growing success and the growing importance of these kinds of cities, the city, smaller cities with a highly skilled, um, uh, highly high, high skills base, with often with academic institutions at the heart of them, with growing economies, um, but also highlighted in this case a lack of sufficient and suitable housing as probably being the key risk to their continuing success. And it's, it's very clear that if you look at that arc, you've got two of the three um, least affordable housing markets in the entire country within it. And even looking at Milton Keynes and Northampton as the other cities within that region, the house prices in those areas were, where, where they've once been comparatively affordable were catching up rapidly with those in other parts of the, in other parts of the country. Um, but despite this, and despite a widespread recognition amongst everyone that we went to talk to, that there was a housing crisis in this, in this area of the country, um, and despite the fact that there were well-developed plans for major new infrastructure to link the cities in the arc, both uh, uh, um, joining up some of the A roads to create an expressway that ran between, that ran between the two, and um, proposals for the use of uh, some uh, currently unused railway infrastructure and some new infrastructure to provide an east-west rail link between the two. Despite the recognition of the problem, despite the potential tools for a solution, we saw very little joining up between thinking about transport provision and housing provision, either at local and regional level or within national government. So we made recommendations in four main areas through that report. And that, actually, no, sorry, five main areas through that report. Um, and I think these are, there are lessons within this that can be applied to other areas of the country. It's not one size fits all, but I think there is a lot that can be drawn upon from this. Um, the first was simply that an area facing this kind of challenge, a much greater level of ambition was needed on housing and the leadership was required to drive that through and to build acceptance and consensus around that across the region. So we argued that if you looked at current plans, you looked at the shortfall in those current plans against need and then you thought about how broader economic changes in the country might pan out which might see this, these, these areas playing a role in terms of supporting growth not just in London but also north towards Birmingham and the East Midlands we thought that you were looking at in total somewhere around a million new homes being required by 2050 so we're trying to take a longer term perspective than has historically been taken on housing requirements and building consensus around a number that people could, people could grasp and plan towards. And in order to make that happen, we argued then for accelerated development of the transport schemes, but making them conditional upon the associated development of a, of a plan for housing, for housing delivery linked to them. And in particular, in our view, a plan that did not just look at piecemeal development, but looked at the opportunities for major new settlements in that corridor particularly where the new road and rail infrastructure made sites more viable for such settlements than they might have been in the past. Third, we made recommendations in terms of the need for joined up governance across the corridor. Part of the problem in the past had been the lack of cross-boundary working between different local authorities. There's movement in the right direction um, at, both ends of the, uh, at both ends of the arc, particularly in the Cambridge area where a uh, a new mayor for Cambridge and Peterborough was elected during the course of our work, but in the centre there wasn't that same degree. There weren't those mechanisms for people to work together, and there was certainly no forum to think about the needs of the of the arc as a whole. Um, fourth, we argued for enhanced land value capture mechanisms. Um, though I would say the recommendations we made were incremental rather than transformative, and we are nervous of the claims that some people make for the ability of land value capture to be a, a magic bullet to pay for both infrastructure and other kinds of supporting development of all kinds. And fifth, we argued, which I think is crucial, certainly in terms of the, the work that we've done on London and other cities as well, better integration between the planning of strategic transport, often led by the Department for Transport or the major national agencies like Network Rail, and local transport led by the cities or the, dish or the, or the counties themselves. But in addition, which I something else that I think is in, important in the context of today's debate, um, I think in the, in the work that we did in the Cambridge-Oxford corridor, we also recognised for the first time um, the importance of a place-based approach. 
Um, certainly as a former de Department of Transport civil servant, I'm, I'm, I'm steeped in trying to answer transport problems by developing demand models and carrying out complicated, uh, complicated economic case analysis and looking at capacity versus, versus demand figures. But actually in the context of this corridor, we, we noted that if you were to be able to deliver the level of housing growth we, we felt would be required and to support the economic development that that would enable, you needed to look at this not as a, uh, not as a set of, of cells in a spreadsheet, but you needed to look at the nature of the area itself, the ways in which that development might be, might be accommodated and the impacts that it, might, that it might have. So we worked with Tom Holbrook and Fifth Studio to look at how the, le the housing ambition could be delivered and the types of development that might support it. We weren't seeking to identify every sp specific locations and say there must be X number of houses here, but we were looking at the opportunities for different kinds of development across the corridor that when brought together might deliver an outcome broadly along the lines that we were, that we were proposing. Um, we highlighted strongly the importance of development that reflected the character of the local environment and that was baked right at the heart of Fifth Studio's work and we recommended the establishment of a regional design panel that would actually provide a mechanism to ensure that that quality of development, that local character of development was actually, was actually delivered. And finally, um, we ran a placemaking competition which attracted over 70 entries um, to stimulate new thinking about what kind of settlements could be delivered and how they might operate within a, within a corridor of this kind. And a place making and something that was very specifically focused on the area itself rather than abstract theories of what new, uh, new developments and new homes might look like. Um, and I think the, uh, the leader of the, of the team that put that, the winning proposal together, a scheme called Velocity, which recognised the... Uh, the uh, a very high proportion of cycling across the corridor and built that into thinking about new developments uh, are going to be participating in one of the panels and talking later today. Um, on the back of that work on the, on the Cambridge-Oxford corridor, we're continuing to press, press government for a response to our work. We're continuing to make sure, try and make sure that that connection between transport and housing is happening at every level. But we're also building that thinking into our next major report, which is our first ever national infrastructure assessment. This is probably the, the, most, the largest and most significant part of our remit as an organisation. Um, once every five years, we're asked to produce an overarching assessment of national infrastructure needs and of how those needs might best be met, um, looking across transport, water, communications, energy, flood defences, and looking at the interaction between those infrastructure sectors and the delivery of new housing in the UK. Um, we published our interim national infrastructure assessment in, uh, in October last year for consultation. Um, the consultation closed in January and we're now working towards the development of the final assessment which we expect to publish later this summer. Um, and cities again have been a key theme running through that document. We identified seven core priorities for national infrastructure and productive livable cities um, were one of those seven priorities. There are actually issues to do with the urban environment crop up throughout the report. Um, once again, we saw the integration of planning for transport and housing as being absolutely key. Um, cities are amongst them, are the drivers of our economy, as I said, it's where we're seeing a lot of the population growth our cities are increasingly successful in many cases, but at the, at the, at the, the challenges to those successes are around often our ability to provide the homes that those growing populations need and to provide functioning uncongested transport networks that allow the people living within them to get to and from the places where they work and, to, and for the economic growth to happen. So look, we're looking at how you can integrate transport and housing plans more effectively to support that we're looking at how you can build on the existing pattern of devolution and provide, perhaps provide greater powers and greater flexibilities to city leaders to deliver. Um, we're looking at how you can provide stable long-term funding for city transport. And we think this is a really crucial issue. London has benefited hugely from clarity about its clarity for how its transport will be funded. 
from, the, from a, a stable platform in which to plan for the long term, but other cities haven't benefited from that. And too often, funding for city infrastructure has been around short-term pots into which cities, competitive pots into which cities, cities have to bid, making it very difficult to make sort of strategic decisions about where you want to, where you want to go. So we're looking at whether you can provide the same kind of funding to city leaders that Network Rail and now Highways England are benefiting from in terms of stable five-year or perhaps longer or shorter um, funding mechanisms. And we're also looking at things like the role of mass transit um, and the role of sustainable modes of travel, such as walking and cycling, and the impact of changes in the vehicle mix as, as connected and autonomous vehicles come, on, come online, or electric vehicles come online, the impact these might have on our cities. Um, we think that connected and autonomous vehicles could change the way our cities operate very significantly. Um, if the risks aren't managed, then they could change things for the worse. If we look at how those risks can be dealt with and the opportunities they bring, they could help change things for the better. But we don't think that they are a replacement for effective mass transit. We don't think they're a replacement for supporting sustainable modes of travel. And we're looking at how that mix can operate most effectively as we go forward. And finally, building on what I said about sort of placemaking and about quality of infrastructure, we're looking at the case for a national design panel to uh, link together the, the work that's been happening on HS2 in Highways England, hope, we hope in the Cambridge-Oxford corridor and some other um, Thames Tideway, and actually provide a national framework for ensuring that the infrastructure that we build is well designed, meets the needs of the people who will use it, has a degree of quality that will help it be sustainable for the long term and win consensus, and deliver something that will have value over the centuries rather than simply over the short term. So cities, as I say, have been at the heart of our work. We are, we've been engaging strongly with city leaders around the country, with some of the, some of the groups who are, who are most effective in this, who are doing most work in this area, including the Centre for Cities. We expect to continue that as we go forward. We hope to build on the work we've done in the National Infrastructure Assessment to do some di direct work with some, some individual cities to try and look at how the principles that we're proposing might filter down at city region level. And um, we really believe that if the right decisions are taken, and in particular the right funding and governance structures are put in place, our cities can continue to be extremely successful places to live work and support the economy. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope you have a really successful day and uh, I'm very happy to answer questions if we have time.